live event. My name is Adele Halliday and I serve as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead Staff at the National Office of the United Church of Canada. And we're really glad that you have joined us here this, today. Uh, today we're exploring the theme, Youth Engagement in Anti-Racism. And that session will be led by Hannah Kim Craig and Thea Sherid Sheridan Jonah. And I will introduce them more fully in a moment. Just a bit of background around the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. Um, there's a full webpage where you can download uh, information. There are daily activities for learning, engagement, children's activities, faith reflections, um, ideas for commitment and advocacy. Here's an example of the web page and we'll put the, web, the link for the web page in the chat in a moment. As part of the 40 days, there are weekly books that are highlighted. This, week, um, this week's book on anti-racism is called but I don't see you as an as Asian duration conversations about racism by Bruce Reyes Chows, who's a former moderator of the Presbyterian Church USA. Uh, it's available from the United Church Bookstore, and if you were to order two or more books, you would receive a twenty percent discount on the books. Um, and the, if you use the discount code Forty Days, that um, discount will be available until November twenty seventh. So this and all more is available uh, as part of the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism, including a weekly newsletter so you can keep up to date with all that's going on. And the program is running from now until November 26th. I would love to introduce to you um, our two speakers for today. Um, and they are uh, Hannah Kim Craig and Thea, Thea Sheridan Jonah. Um, both of them have written content for the 40 days. Um, Hannah wrote about colorism, shadism, beauty standards, and race. That was day three. And today, uh, for day 13, is on unmasking racial fetishization. Uh, Thea wrote about racism, poverty, and a livable income. And that was for day eight. So Hannah is a first-year student at the University of Toronto. And she hopes to study education and society as well as French. Within the United Church, she has been working as the anti-racism youth animator, a role that she took on in the summer. And in the free time, she contemplates the absurdity of the English language in French and Korean simultaneously. Thea uses she, her pronouns, is 18 years old, and has been working as a youth social justice animator intern at the General Council office. Her home church is St. Paul's United Church in Oakville, Ontario, and she has been part of the Horseshoe Falls Regional Executive. While she has moved to Vancouver to attend university, she hopes to continue her involvement with the United Church. So welcome to Hannah and Thea, who will lead us in a conversation today about uh, youth engagement and anti-racism. For all of, the, all of those who are here, if you have questions, comments, um, please feel free to type them into the chat. Uh, they will try to pick them up in the conversation, but there'll be a dedicated question and answer time at the very end of the conversation. Um, but in the meantime, please feel free to type them into the chat um, as we go along. So again, welcome Hannah and Thea, it's over to you. Thank you, Adele. Um, and to start off our uh, conversation today, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. So um, as we are all situated in different spaces in this virtual setting, uh, feel free. Um, I, I invite everyone to uh, remember the lands on which you find yourself today. And if you would like to write them in the chat, that is, feel free to do so. To me, land acknowledgements are a reminder of many things. For one, it is a reminder that I'm sustained on stolen land. This land, which is now called Toronto, holds rich histories of many nations, including but not limited to the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse Indigenous communities. Land acknowledgements are also a reminder that this land has witnessed a cultural genocide that leaves many of us with a lack of proper education and awareness of these nations, their rich histories, and their present realities. I heard a saying that resonated with me deeply, which said that rather than inheriting land from ancestors, we are borrowing this land from our future generations. And I urge us all to remember this saying uh, and that until the safety, security, autonomy, and brilliance of all future generations are respected and protected, every day is a day to work towards reconciliation and nurture long lasting relationships with indigenous communities. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so I'm going to 
open us in prayer. Um, and I invite everyone listening to uh, listen along to the prayer that I'm reading or pray from your heart, whatever is calling on you, um, whatever makes you most comfortable and most ready to start this evening. So I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly parent, as we gather together, we call on you to guide us through reflection, action, and commitment to our ongoing work to be an anti-racist church. Our time together is an opportunity to learn, to be in community and pursue the world of justice you call us to create. A world of justice begins with each of us. A world of anti-racism relies on the actions of each of us. Through pursuing this work together, we can use our varied strengths and passions to create a world where there are no conditions or exclusions. A world where we can extend our arm to welcome all. A world built on love, justice, and the care you showed each of us. We pray to feel your spirit moving within and through each of us to propel us to continue this work look beyond our limited perspectives and work together. We pray for vulnerability and an openness to discomfort because we know that this is how real change begins. In your justice seeking name we pray, amen. Okay, uh, so as Adele mentioned, uh, when thinking about this evening, um, Hannah and I wanted to focus a bit on what both of us wrote our articles on, but more than that, as both of us come from the perspectives of youth in the church, focus on how we engage specifically youth in the anti-racism work that we're doing. Um, so we're each going to spend about 10 minutes telling some stories of our own experience, our own uh, anti-racism work and just general work in the United Church. Uh, so I'll start and then Hannah will tell you a bit more about her experience in a few minutes. So as Adele mentioned, um, we're both first year university students. I'm currently in Vancouver at the University of British Columbia. Um, and I just moved out, moved out here from Ontario. Over the summer, both Hannah and I were working as interns uh, with the general counsel office. And my title was Youth Social Justice Animator. And going into that role, I kind of had a overview, understanding, kind of general idea of what this work could mean. Um, something along the lines of youth engagement and something along the lines of social justice. Um, but coming into it, I didn't know what kinds of projects I'd be working on or what social justice issues I'd be tackling. <clears throat> And one of the parts that I loved when I first started was I got two, one or two weeks to just look at all of the social justice work that the United Church had been doing. And so I don't know if anyone's looked at the faith and politics pages on the United Church website, but I spent about two weeks just reading everything I could on there um, about all the work that had been done and was being done. And then I got the opportunity to go back um, to uh, Amy Crawford and Adele and uh, more people at the general counsel office and tell them what I was interested in doing, as well as what projects they wanted me to work on. Um, and one of the projects that I began working on was around guaranteed livable income, which many of you know is something the United Church has been involved in for decades. Um, but before coming into the job, before starting um, at the General Council this summer, 
I didn't know much about guaranteed livable income. I knew bits and pieces. I had heard politicians talk about it. I had heard other people talk about it, but I hadn't engaged in the work myself. But by being able to choose what I wanted to do, um, by having mentors around me um, who were letting me choose what I was passionate about and what I wanted to work on, um, that became one of the projects. And so that's part of why I wrote my article on guaranteed livable income and poverty. Uh, and how that intersects with racism. Now, as I mentioned a bit ago, when I began, Hannah and I will be overviewing our articles, but we're hoping more to talk about youth engagement. So why did I tell that story about starting to work around guaranteed livable income? Whenever I think about youth and engaging youth in the United Church, I always think about how we tend to come at it from perspectives of how can we include youth? What are we doing that we can bring youth into? What is our community doing that youth might like? But I think that we need to flip that narrative. Instead, we need to ask, what are youth doing? What are youth already passionate about? What are things that youth are already contributing to? And how do we uplift the talents and efforts and work that they're already doing? My window's open and I hear screaming. I don't know if that is, <laughs> everyone can hear that, but I'm gonna close my window in case. Okay, um, so we need to, instead of asking where we can include youth, we need to ask what youth are already doing and what youth are already passionate about. So I have another story to demonstrate how this has been prevalent in my own life. Uh, I often describe myself as a committee person, um, which as a 18 year old isn't always a common thing. Um, but ever since I became a part of my home church back in Ontario, uh, I always wanted to get involved and I wanted to be involved for some reason in the governance of the church, just because that's what I happen to be passionate about. And so when I was 11 or 12, I asked my minister and I asked um, my community of faith if there was space for me on a committee, if there was, if it was okay for a young person to be on a committee. And I was supported, I was uh, brought onto the worship committee and it was a process. I had to learn what it meant to vote on a committee, what it meant to help with communion and help with all the other things that the worship committee uh, was doing. But the only reason that I was able to even ask is there a committee that I can join? I'm Here's this thing that I'm passionate about. I want to get involved. The only reason that I was able to ask was because the community was already supporting me. The community already made me feel like it was a safe space where I could not just exist and be at worship and be in Sunday school, but that my voice mattered and that my voice, even as a young person, was valuable to the community. And this later meant that a few years later, I began, uh, I asked another question and I said, can I chair the affirming committee? It, can a young person chair? Um, and so I was able to chair the affirming committee. And just like when I asked if I could be on a committee. Again, the only reason that I felt comfortable even asking was because I already felt like my voice mattered. 
and someone else wasn't asking me. I wasn't, although it is beneficial to be able to go up to youth and ask, hey, do you wanna join this thing? Hey, here's this thing we're doing. There are times when that is amazing and it, very beneficial and very necessary. But we also need to learn to let youth ask questions, to let people come forward because they already know that they're valued. So thinking on your communities, thinking on the communities of faith you're a part of, the groups that your church is already running, the youth events that are already running, where do you see youth passionate? Are they passionate about making art? Are they passionate about video editing? Do they speak multiple languages that they might be able to help translate things in? Could they use their art to create promotional material for the anti-racism work that, that your church is doing? Could they create a video series with other youth about their perspectives on racism? What are youth in your community already passionate about? We often, as I started, ask people to join and get included uh, or get involved. But we often don't look towards what we're already doing, what's already strong in our communities. And I think that we need to start to shift our perspective to be able to first make youth and young people comfortable and then get them involved in the work that we're doing. The last thing I'll touch on is um, how this can also help with tokenism. As young people in the church, we're often put on committees or put on uh, given seats at the table, but our voices aren't fully given the same weight or our stories or our experiences aren't given the same credit because we're young people or we don't understand entirely. But when we flip the narrative to get youth more involved in what they're already passionate about, we're not tokenizing them because they're youth. We're looking at all the amazing things that they're doing and saying, we want to uplift what you're doing. We see that you have this passion and we want to invest in you. And not only will that make our communities of faith stronger as a whole, it'll show youth that you care. You care about what they're doing, but more importantly, you care about them and the things that they're already passionate about. So now that I'm looking at my timer and I'm at almost exactly 10 minutes, um, I'm going to hand it over to Hannah and she's going to share some of her wisdom. So. Thank you, Thea. And um, for those of you who entered a little later on the um, Zoom or on Facebook, uh, feel free to ask any questions or any comments in the chat. Uh, we have a dedicated Q&A at the end that we'll try to um, get uh, at all those questions and comments. Uh, yeah, so for me, when I think about my own experiences getting involved in the church and with activism, I remember being very nervous. <laughs> And that wasn't always the case. I grew up in the church. Both of my parents are very involved uh, in the church and I was often the minister's daughter um, every Sunday. Uh, so, and on top of that, I was very outspoken, very talkative, always wanted to be um, speaking in front of people and being at the pulpit. I'm, I'm sure I went multiple times um, at a young age, but as I got older, and started to gain a bit more knowledge and have more experiences and um, realize there are so many talented and wonderful people in the world. I also started to reflect on myself and my own abilities and got very conscious about um, whether I really could contribute to um, communities like the church. 
and whether my capabilities were enough um, in those spaces. Um, and I'm sure that there are many young people in the church that feel the same way. Uh, and I, one thing that did help me a lot when I was getting involved in the church was that it wasn't um, that I was there as a young person, but that I knew people within the congregation that I could go to. And so for all congregations, when we want to engage young people um, in church life, um, it's about creating opportunities to get to know them as individuals rather than um, just people who can contribute. And so that, that means creating opportunities not only for activism, but just for young people to get to know you um, as someone, as a member of the congregation. And we, as United Church, I feel we are amazing at creating events to like build that community from like potlucks to uh, fundraisers um, and attending Pride Parade. Like we do a lot of things as a huge uh, congregation, but I think um, it's really equally important to have those smaller events like uh, like a after service pizza lunch with um, the few young people at your congregation and the and a few other more um, uh, experienced members of the congregation to be uh, to have a time to just get to know them and there's less pressure um, for the young person to uh, to be a young person, but just to get to know other people in the congregation. And one thing that that does is lets young people um, name one or two people in the congregation that they know and that they can go to to ask questions. And it leads to this kind of mentorship role um, to have someone um, who has more experiences, to know that it's okay to make mistakes and to know that they are appreciated um, even in those mistakes and those fumbles, getting involved um, uh, just as they are. And that will help um, young people gain more confidence. And you'll be able to, as you get to know um, young people one-on-one, -on -one, that uh, you'll gauge their comfort level as well as their interests, as Thea was mentioning, where they're passionate, but also how um, comfortable they are speaking in front of people. Um, if they're often very shy, if they enjoy... Um, I know many people feel more comfortable writing than they do speaking. It's the, the best way that they can express themselves. So reminding ourselves that youth-led initiatives should have a space, but that young people can contribute at any level. And it doesn't have to be only a leadership role in front of large crowds. It's a matter of giving them that space to get involved in any way they can and to know that they can um, make mistakes and grow within the church. Um, and to kind of seal that, I wanted to mention a story within my own uh, home church uh, in Saskatoon. Um, I was about six or seven at the time, so I was in Sunday school, but there was an initiative within the church to make the accessibility ramp in the church more welcoming. The space was um, quite dark and the walls were concrete and the church thought this would be um, this is some place we have to work on. And so they had this, among other brilliant ideas, like painting the, the walls pink, um, they had an idea to create a large uh, painting. Um, and it was very colorful, huge, it covered one wall. Um, but the special thing about this canvas was that it was made up of smaller canvases. Um, and so they thought that this would be a way to get um, young people, they could each paint a square or two uh, and then bring them all together and create this wonderful artwork. And it was um, a matter of reaching young people where they were at at the time, which was apparently painting, and letting them contribute to something within the church that um, was going on. And um, every time I do, I look at that painting, I still remember um, that uh, time and how much fun it was and um, reminds me of why I'm involved in the church like I am today. So that's a bit about youth engagement, but when speaking about anti-racism, there's a whole other topic, getting the conversation started within the church. How, how do we get the conversation started with young people? And I think one, there's a few barriers that we face. Um, one is that uh, we're afraid of causing younger people and talking about these experiences and in mentioning them 
um, were afraid that they might feel distressed, they might um, have negative experiences, they might lose confidence and be more fearful of the, the topic of racism. And there's another barrier, which might be that we feel that they won't understand the topics, um, being that there's they can be at times very complex and um, all of us are still um, better understanding it as we go. And so how can we really introduce these topics to younger um, audiences when um, we don't understand it as much ourselves? And um, I think it's a, a good reminder for all of us that whether or not we discuss the topic with younger people, and no matter how young they are, racism exists and they will go through and be subject to those difficult and traumatic experiences, um, especially if they are racialized. And so it's not about whether children can't understand racism, but it's about giving them that language and that they don't have that language to name those experiences at their age. And many of us as um, younger people, we didn't get that, uh, we didn't have that conversation either. Um, and for myself, um, my pieces that I spoke on, shadism, racial fetishization, and Eurocentric beauty standards, those were not things that I, I really understood um, or not understood, but I didn't have that language. I didn't know what those, those words meant. I didn't know what I felt meant when I was insecure about how I looked um, in comparison to what I was seeing around me. And so again, when tackling these topics, it's important to remember that racism um, is an uncomfortable and difficult topic, but it's something that young people can um, understand. And it's something very important actually that we should talk about. Um, and, uh, it's especially within the church, it's very important because it shows younger people within this community that it's okay to bring up those experiences and um, learn to put a name to what they experience. It can help them process their own experiences and better understand themselves. Um, and as a young person, it also makes you feel less alone because everything feels like um, a battle and a huge uphill um, sometimes. And so those experiences can be internalized if we don't talk about them because they're uncomfortable. Um, and so when we equip young people with that language and that they're supported um, by their church, they will, they'll, uh, it will help them to grow. Uh, and on that, talking about anti-racism and racism can also foster that passion um, to do something, to take initiative within the church um, and let out those emotions and those experiences that they have. Um, for myself, uh, once I, I was given the opportunity to learn about racial fetishization and about shadism, um, I was able to get more curious and wanted to look into it more. And eventually it did lead me to writing those pieces um, for this 40 days. Um, of engagement in anti-racism. But without that language and without me being exposed to that, um, I would not have been able to uh, understand them. And if I had learned about racial fetishization, as for, as a, for example, or shadism as I grew up, um, or the fact that our beauty standards are very Eurocentric, my insecurities growing up would have had less of an impact because I could have hold, held those insecurities with the word. And I could have realized this is not me and this does, this does not have to be the reality that I choose, but that it was built around me and it was I was taught to feel and think this way. And once we get that conversation within the church, um, it will really help um, younger people feel and go through those experiences like I did. So altogether, when we're trying to engage young people in anti-racism activism within the church, one, we want to engage them at their skills and at their comfort level and that they can contribute at any level of the event and have equal importance. And it doesn't have to be a leadership role. And eventually, hopefully, the young person will gain confidence within the church to be able to take that initiative and to be able to ask those questions. Um, and another way to gain, give children confidence within the church is to help them name their experiences. Uh, and, by do, and talking about racism, it will always be a traumatic experience. It will always leave scars, but it's something that young people will eventually have to go through, which is a sad 
reality of our world today. But to be able to have those that language for them to be able to understand and also know that the church is a safe space and anti-racist. Um, so uh, with that, I believe our next, um, what we would like to uh, do now is to reach out to everyone here um, and do some breakout sessions. Um, and we would like to ask um, all of you uh, to reflect on or share ways your community is already engaged in anti-racism and separately how you are fostering youth passion already within your church. And um, uh, we can do that now. If there are any questions at this point, um, uh, feel free to let us know. Um, but we'll, I think the groups will be about four to five people. You'll have about seven minutes to kind of discuss. Again, um, we're reflecting and sharing ways our community is already engaged in anti-racism and also how we are fostering youth's passions. Um, and I'll, I'll just mention, I think that just to clarify the question, I put the question in the chat and why we're asking you to reflect on them separately is um, we want you to look at the ways that your community is already doing well and the strengths that your community, whether that's a community of faith or whether that's um, another faith-based community or United Church-based community that you're a part of, um, reflect on the strengths that your community has for engagement and reflect then, hopefully those conversations can start a conversation about how we use the strengths that our community already has to then engage more youth and more specifically engage more youth in anti-racism. So the purpose of the question is to get you to reflect on the strengths you already have instead of what you feel is missing. Um, so that we can move forward and engage youth and also maybe talk with the people in your groups about what they're already doing and get some ideas flowing back and forth. So I think we will get um, you put into groups very soon, uh, just so that you know when we come back, uh, the We'll have a bit of time for reflection on what you talked about in your breakout rooms, and then we will have Q&A so you can ask Hannah and I any questions you have about the articles we wrote or the um, talk today. So I will let, I think, breakout rooms now, if that is good from a tech perspective. All good, let's go in. Okay. I'm back. As I think most people should be back now, um, we hope that the conversations in the breakout rooms were um, productive and meaningful. Um, at this time, I think we're just gonna give people a moment if there was anything that stood out to you in your reflection or your talk with your group um, whether it was a strength that you thought of of your community of faith or something that you reflected on outside of the question about what um, Hannah and I said uh, feel free to put that in the chat now um, because we can't see videos and everyone is still muted we'd love to hear a bit about what was talked about in the groups, um, just so that we can get a sense of where people are at right now. So we'll give you some time if people are writing. It doesn't need to be anything significant. It can be a few words.
So there's some about room four, diversity rules. Okay, I like that. Um, at this time, you can also start thinking, uh, you can, unfortunately, you can't talk. You're muted by the host. We're hoping to just have uh, some chat uh, box um, if there was anything that stood out, just to give people an opportunity. Thank you for coming. At this time, we're also going to have a period of questions. If there are any questions that people had, um, you can start thinking about those and Hannah and I can try to answer questions. Um, there's something in the chat from Deborah in Pacific Mountain region development of leadership in youth is happening through participation and leadership roles in camp spirit. Yeah. people um, feel free as again to um, contribute anyway um, in the chat but I just wanted to um, I saw the land acknowledgments and I'm very happy to see um, Ed Edmonton Calgary um, it's very cool that everyone is from across Canada mm -hmm. There were two other reflections in the chat. We spoke about the presence and absence of youth in our communities. Uh, and then they said, what a bonus to see you two leading this event. Um, I think that that's something that Hannah and I didn't touch too directly on, but I know that in a lot of communities, the issues are not issues, but the, the worries come from not having enough youth. Um, and I think that that is something that is shared among churches um, and not something that we can fully address in just this setting. But I know in lots of conversations that I've had and that Hannah and I have had with other youth, one of the things that engages youth and tends to bring in youth is social justice work and is the ability to help and do work like anti-racism work. Um, that's not an uh, answer, but it's an idea. Do you want to read some more of them, Hannah, or comment on any of them? Yeah, sure. Um, Deborah said at East End United, we are sharing discussion about the book, White Fragility. Awesome. Yeah, I'm so sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, inspiring stories of youth involvement, even in the midst of chaos and wandering in the general congregation, even if it's just one youth, similar experience of wanting to help, but not wanting to impose, going out to folks instead of inviting them in. Yeah, I, and again, just, um, uh, I really feel for that, just having the one youth wanting to help but not wanting to impose. Um, I know for some youth, it's really hard to reach out. Um, and like all people, we get shy in spaces we feel um, we shouldn't fill. Um, but yeah, really getting to reach out first to get to know them as people, really. Um, and having those opportunities first. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, go ahead, Thea. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, and then someone said, instead of a youth group, our younger members are involved in the work of congregation. When we were in the affirming ministry process, they were great allies and taught us a lot. I think that's definitely a common <clears throat> thread that we hear, like the ability for youth to teach and the ability for you to bring new perspectives. Then in our pan con generation or pan-generational congregation all age categories contrib contribute share and learn together someone asked does UCC uh, have initiatives for churches with low youth numbers to participate in or engage with um, not any that I could directly link to there may be some people who are able to do that um, but I think a good 
just general ideas, talking with the churches in your own area and maybe your region to see if there's any um, initiatives for youth from a wider sense. Deborah, our church is engaging with the young man leading a skateboard social justice group for youth. I'd love to see it. I'll just remind you guys, if you have any questions at this time, Hannah and I are also open to answering those. It's great to see all of the reflection, um, but just to put it out there again. There's lots more coming in the chat. Someone said, our congregation is wealthy, old, and white. Oh, dear. Um, I, think, I think that is something that a lot of our congregations experience um, uh, in Canada, uh, especially as the dominant culture is white um, and in many cases, wealthy and old. Um, our congregations are going to be made up of people who are largely a part of the dominant culture. And I think that when we talk about our communities being a part of the dominant culture, um, we can also talk about what are ways that we can learn internally, what are ways that we can engage with anti-racism internally. Um, so that we can become a brave space and a safe space for people um, searching for communities and not necessarily uh, focusing on the lack of representation your community has, but the ability your, con your, the ability your congregation has to learn and grow um, despite not having diversity because Often um, when congregations are mainly the dominant culture, we turn to the only uh, racialized or um, marginalized people in the communities and get them to do the learning for us or get them to teach us. And I think instead we kind of need to self reflect and be able to do that work internally um, no matter how representative our communities are of the diversity around us. I don't know if you want to touch any on that, Hannah, but. Yeah, I, um, a lot of what Thea said, the opportunity to educate ourselves, to have that conversation um, amongst, um, internally, like Thea mentioned. Um, I know for my um, congregation, at St. Matthew's in Aurora, um, here in Ontario, they have decided to start a, not a book study, but a kind of a gathering weekly or so to uh, read the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission that the volume one, I believe they're going through. And um, there are lots of books out there that would be awesome to have a discussion on. Um, like a book club, um, but be able to reflect on what you read and that sort of conversation. I think that can be very valuable, um, even without young people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, the chat is pretty quiet at this point. Um, if there are any questions people have, Hannah and I, are happy to stay on. We're gonna be here for a bit anyway. So if you want to stay and ask questions, you are welcome to. Um, but I think Adele is gonna say some last words. Oh. Uh, just to offer our thanks and appreciation to Hannah and Thea for guiding us through this conversation today. Um, and, and really leading us through uh, how, how to engage the conversation around youth engagement in anti-racism work. So thank you very much for that. Um, as mentioned, they'll stick around for a few more minutes in case you have additional questions that you'd like to raise. And thank you once again for this time. Mm -hmm.